This is our last week to talk through a, a series we've been doing, Asking for a Friend. We've been trying to answer questions that people ask, uh, but they don't necessarily feel comfortable maybe asking in church or in a small group. Trying to cover some of the stuff that people talk about, but they don't really want to ask out loud. And, and this week's is why, if the church claims to be full of followers of Jesus, is there so much hurt in church? And that's a good question. Uh, once, when we were in California, uh, we had a, a, a rash of purse thieves, a th purse thieving that happened there. Uh, three, or four, three or four or five ladies had their purses stolen. And uh, we never did totally know for sure who did it. We, we, uh, uh, the first time it happened, we thought, well, maybe it didn't even happen here. Maybe somebody, the second time it happened, we thought, well, maybe somebody came in from outside. You know, our building was a little bit wide open there on, maybe somebody came in who we didn't know and, and so the third time it happened, uh, well, it was a smaller group and we, we kind of had some ideas of who was or was not in that room and it was hard to know for sure. And, 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 and how are we gonna let the people know? You know, people are starting to kind of murmur about it and whisper about it. Don't go to First Christian, get your purse stolen. And so, and so we, we had, uh, how, we, how do we let people know? And we decided we just gotta tell them, you know, tell the whole church, hey, when you're here, try to keep an eye on your stuff because some of our folks aren't saved yet. And, uh, and we said it in kind of a funny, funny way like that and, and, and uh, uh, hope that people would be understanding. And for the most part, for the most part they were. For the most part, people were, were sympathetic of our position and, and understood what it was that, that we was trying to say. It's a hard thing about church, you know, we, we, we all come together and we're all dressed up a little bit there and, and, and we probably be on our best behavior while we're there. And yet, we're at all different levels of being saved. And there's certainly people with us every week who have no relationship yet with Jesus. There are people who attend church every week and, uh, and they're a mess. And it is confusing. How come is that true? Why, why, if we're all followers of Jesus, why, if Jesus is real, is there so much uh, hurt in the church? You know, some of the meanest people I've ever met were Christians. So what's your thinking there? And of course, that's a big topic. I could, I could talk about this for hours and hours and hours probably and not get uh, to the bottom of it or, or cover every last possible thing. But, but uh, it basically comes down to, to two things. Uh, hypocrisy, which is something Jesus talked about quite a bit, and, and then the sin nature, which is a phrase that I'm not sure is, is used exactly uh, in the Bible uh, that all that often, but it's talked about. And, and this notion of our sinful flesh and how our sin nature uh, 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 operates on us. And I want to talk about both those things a little bit because that's, that's why we have the hurt that we do. Uh, on hypocrisy, uh, Jesus uses that word, uh, hypocrite. It's, it's a Greek word. Actually, almost sounds the same way. Hippocrates is a Greek word. It means an actor. And Jesus takes that word and he applies it in the, in the issue of a religious context that it's somebody who pretends to be a believer, but they're not really. They, they pretend like they have it together, but they don't. Jesus talks about hypocrisy a lot of different places, but two chapters that are kind of gold star chapters for this conversation are Matthew chapter 6, especially the early part of it, and Matthew chapter 23. In Matthew 6, Jesus says, be careful, he says, not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, he says, you'll have no reward from your Father in, in heaven. And then after this verse, he goes on to talk about different ways a person could, could do acts of righteousness in front of other people. Maybe with your giving. You could give a really big gift that everybody saw and they all oohed and awed about how generous you were. But he says if you're just doing it to get that applause, then, then God's not going to give you any reward for that. It doesn't, you're not doing it for God. Or maybe in fasting, you know, a person could say, well, I'm going to go for a while without eating to show my devotion and to think harder and focus more on God. But, but if your whole motive of doing it is to get everybody to talk about, man, look how tough he is. Look how strong of a moral character he has. Prayer could be that way. Nothing wrong with praying. And there's nothing wrong with praying in front of other people. But if I'm praying in such a way as to try to impress other people, I'm not really talking to God at all. I'm just trying to make other people see how righteous and holy I am. Well, then this verse starts to apply. He says, you need to be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others, to be seen by them. And, and that, that's, of course, the, 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 the key phrase, right? To, to, to be seen by them. 
He says, when you're, when you're just doing it to, to be seen, well, then it's not going to count for anything else. You, you got what you came for. Your motive was to impress other people, and, and you sure did. But God's not impressed with that kind of thing and because it, it belies a heart that's not really His, right? It, it, it gives evidence to a heart that, that either um, is using religion just to feed their own ego, and there's certainly Christians like that. And no Christian, no Christian who is like that ever realizes right off that it's talking about them. But, it, but, but, but there's no love. There's no joy. There's no, there's no kindness in how they act. They're not gentle. They're not patient. And, and they might be in charge of a committee or they might be in charge of a, of a, of a, of a ministry team of some sort at church. They might be in charge of, of big things. But, but their heart isn't close to God. Okay, that, that's one way of being hypocrisy. And some people uh, uh, aren't even really pursuing God. They don't ever take time to pray or to read or to be quiet in His presence. They don't ever uh, try to get God's uh, presence in them. It's not really something they think about. All their thoughts as it regards Christianity or religion is based on how they interact with other people. You know, how their team that they're in charge of or their small group or how whatever they're doing is... Count. And, and, and so Jesus says, be, just be careful, He says, right? Just, just, just be really careful that you don't get caught up in that sort of thing. It's easy to do. And another place Jesus talks about is in Matthew chapter 23. He said to the crowds and to His disciples, He says, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, they sit in Moses' seat. And of course, you know, Moses, that, that looks back to the Old Testament, right? And Moses was in charge of all the people. Uh, he's the one who gave them the Ten Commandments, and he's the one who led them through the desert to the Promised Land. And when Moses spoke, the people were supposed to listen. And God says, I've got a relationship with Moses that's not like anybody else, right? He, I speak to Moses face to face. And when Moses died, he, he appointed a man named Joshua to be in charge. And, and when Joshua died, then other guys came along. And, and there were different judges and kings and prophets who led God's people at, at different times. And, and at some level, they all sat in Moses' seat. Guys like Samuel and, and, and David and, and Solomon came along. And, and for, a, for, a, for a certain amount of time, they sat where Moses sat and they were able to talk. But by the time Jesus gets there, it was more of a committee approach, a Sanhedrin, a congress of Jewish people who would make decisions. And they all together collectively spoke for Moses. So Jesus says, you need to listen to him. He says, you, you need to be careful. Remember that's the, 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 what we just, we just read about being careful, the verse right before. It says, you need to be careful to do everything they tell you. So he's talking about religious leaders who are teachers. You know, they, they, the things they're saying, they're quoting Scripture, and you need to listen to it. There's a lot of good stuff there, Jesus says. But he says, don't do what they do, for they don't practice what they preach. If you've ever heard that phrase, that Jesus is the first one to coin that. that. That comes from him. He says, be careful of some of the... They say these things, but they don't do it. He says, they tie up heavy, cumbersome loads... They put them on other people's shoulders, and they themselves are not willing to even lift a finger to help move it. Everything they do is for people to see. They say that they're religious, but they're just doing it for folks. They're not doing it for God anymore. It doesn't mean that what they're saying, if they give a sermon and they quote Scripture, you listen to that Scripture. And by the way, a verse like that, that's directed more at somebody like me or somebody like a small group leader or a teacher. Uh, we need to be careful. Whenever we, uh, we, talk for, we, we pretend to talk for God, we need to be careful not only that we say the right things, but that we practice what we preach. If I'm asking you to do it, then I need to do it too. If I'm asking you to lead in this way, then I need to lead in this way also. And again, this is one of the real tests of a hypocrite, right? They, they talk a good game, but they don't really do it. It doesn't really affect their heart. And getting back to our first question, why is there so much hurt in the church? Well, the, the sad news is that there's, there's a lot of hypocrites in church. There, there are. There's a lot of people who come to church and, and they're, not, they're not really focusing on God. They're focusing on how they come across to other people. And so, so that's one of the reasons. Of course, it's not just that. There's also this notion of a, of a sin nature that we all have. There's a, a part of us, a, a part in us that... Uh, that just rebels. And we're born with it. 
Uh, David says, surely in sin was I born in, in Psalm 51, and that's the truth. Uh, we, uh, I didn't have to be taught to be bad. If you, it, those of you who are watching this who have children, you know you never had to teach your kids how to lie, right? They, they picked that up all by themselves. There was a Ricky Gervais uh, movie a couple years ago, uh, and the, the, the plot of the movie is that no one had ever lied before in the movie, and then Ricky Gervais figures it out how to lie, and, and he's able to just fool everybody because no one's ever, ever lied before. Well, of course, that's just a fantasy, right? No one ever had to teach us how to lie. We got to that all by ourselves. In fact, as a parent, you got to teach your kids to tell the truth and sometimes have to work really hard to get your kids to tell the truth. Uh, you might have to even uh, discipline them to get them to tell, tell the truth and to say what, what's right, even if it's a little bit painful for them to do so. But why is that? Well, it's this, this uh, sin nature that we have. There's a part of us that's broken. And theologians who study such things, who look at Scripture, they trace it all the way back to, to Adam. And, and Paul, in particular, talks a lot about that in Romans chapter 6 and 7 and 8, about how we all inherited this sin nature from Adam. We all inherited this. Uh, he had a perfect Garden of Eden and, and chose to make his own decisions. And that's what sin is. It's a desire to be the boss, a desire to be, I'll, I'll decide for myself what's right and wrong. And because of that sin nature in us, that, that broken thread that all of us carry, uh, uh, we all have sin. John says if we claim to be without sin, then we're just lying to ourselves. Nobody ever gets to a place where that's, that's a part of their past. Uh, like Paul says in a, a Romans, a, what is it, Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, right? And Romans uh, 6, 23, also a, a great passage. For the wages of sin that we've all done is death, but the free gift of God's eternal life. And John's picking up on those same ideas. He says, he says, if we claim to be without sin, we just deceive ourselves. We all have that. No one ever has to be taught how to sin. We come to it ourselves because we all want what we want. And we want to be the boss. Paul says, uh, or John says here, uh, we just have to be honest about that. We all have sin in our lives. But when that happens and we stumble across some sin, when we realize that that part of there, we see it in ourselves and we, we can be blind to it. But when we see it to ourselves, what should we do? Says we need to confess our sins. Now, now, now I, I think this here, I, I think uh, first of all, you, you, you confess it to God, Right. But it's not just uh, to God. Sometimes it's confessing to, to others and asking other people to, to, to look at our life and to think about what it is that we did. If, if I've sinned against my wife, Julia, part of confession might be going to her and saying, God, uh, or, or, or Julia, help me out with this thing. But again, primarily here, primarily, he's talking about confessing it to God. And he says, if, if we confess our sins, he, that's how you know he's talking primarily about God, he's faithful and he's, and he's just. And He'll forgive us our sins. He'll purify our unrighteousness. So we need to be ever alert to the sin that lurks in every one of us because it's there. And when you put a whole bunch of sinners together in one place like this, well, there's going to be hurt on occasion. Because we all have the high expectation that Christ gives us of a, of a new kingdom, of a new creation, right? We can be super impatient with one another as we're trying to figure this thing out. And that causes hurt. We can be blindsided when someone's just pretending and they're kind of being a hypocrite, and that, that certainly causes hurt. And then we can be ignorant about the sin that lurks in us, the sin that lurks in all the people that we hang out with, the, the, the sin that, that can trip any one of us up. And sometimes we can be really ungracious about that when it pops up. Um, it'd be very easy at this point to take just a minute and talk about some of the different times I've been hurt by the church. And I bet you watching this today, you could think of some times when that's happened too. And some of those hurtful moments uh, caused sleepless nights. Some of those hurtful moments uh, made my stomach hurt, gave me headaches, made it to where I just would avoid a certain other people. If I just saw them, I, I, would, I would tense up just seeing them. Uh, some of those, those past hurts, if I was to really think about it very long, I could still get mad even now, even though some of those things go back a long way. But it's always the same things. We're all sinners. We're all doing the best we can. So we need to be gracious to one another. 
And when those hurts come, like they're almost certainly going to do, we need to strive to reconcile. So how do you do that? That's the last thing I want to talk about. Jesus gives us a recipe for that in Matthew chapter 18, verse 15. He says, if your brother or sister sins, and, and, and again, the, the implication is they, they sin against you. Uh, this is not a verse uh, for you to become the morality police. Every time you see a sin in the church, it's your personal job to go rake somebody over the coals for it. It's more they've sinned against you, right? It's the hurt that we go through in church. You was just minding your own business and, and someone lied about you. Or they gossiped about you. Or they took something that wasn't theirs. Uh, you was just minding your own business and someone ignored you. Or someone uh, berated you. Or someone's anger got into your business. You know, you were affected by someone else's sin. And they've sinned against you. Uh, Jesus, and that's who's talking here in Matthew. Jesus says, go show them their fault. Just the two of you. Don't gossip to somebody else about it. Don't ask three or four people their opinion before you go talk about it to the, the first. And, and I've been guilty of that, you know. I know I need to talk to Joe, so I go talk to Steve and Chuck about it, right? Hey, I need to go talk to Joe. Here's what I think I'm going to say. And I can pretend that my motive is, is to get the right information, when sometimes my motive is to get Steve and Chuck on my side, so that no matter how it goes with Joe who sinned against me, Steve and Chuck will be. And you got to be careful of all that stuff. Again, that same word, that phrase, be careful, he says. Be careful, be careful, be careful, because it can sneak up on you. So somebody has sinned against me, what I do? I go and I show them their fault. And he's just the two of us. And if they listen to me, well, then I've won them over. And that, of course, has to be the, the goal, right? I want to win them over. Now, what's that mean? Well, it could mean, I suppose, you win them over to your way of thinking. But I doubt that that's exactly what we're shooting for here because on most of the conflict we have in, with each other, period, whether it be in church or in family or in marriage or wherever else it is, you getting them to 100% go, oh, I never saw what you were saying. Now I understand I was the moron. I mean, people, for the most part, aren't, aren't going to do that sort of thing. So, so, so again, your goal here is not to get 100% agreement with you. Your, your goal here is to be understood, hey, you, you really hurt me here, right? You really let me down. And so you're hoping that they at least understand what you're saying. They don't have to agree with it, but at least they understand what you're saying, right? And even if, if you're pretty sure that you're right, even if you're pretty sure that you were the right one, you, you know, you were right and they were wrong, even if you're pretty sure, your goal is not to get them to crawl back to you. That, that can't be the goal. Your goal is for you to still have relationship. Your goal is still to be two people striving for the same thing. You know, sometimes when you have this conversation, when you, when you have that conversation with somebody else, you're going to realize that the person who was at least mostly wrong in it was you. You go to them all loaded for bear, ready to, to make them crawl, but you realize in having the conversation that you also had done quite a bit to make this problem happen. So, so go in there humble, you know, go in there humble. You did nothing worse than going in there all loaded for bear and then realizing that it, it was you that was the person. So go in there humble. To explain what you were thinking, have open ears, have an open heart. Your goal is for us to reestablish this relationship, for us to be friends, you know, for us to be good. Winning them over is the, is the goal. Jesus, I think, tells us this because there's a couple different temptations when you're hurt. One is just to sit and smolder on it, right? To not either tell the person who did it, maybe not tell anybody, just be in a bad mood and just sit there and smolder and stew. And every time you see him, you try to avoid him there in the foyer. You're just ticked off all the time. Uh, this avoids all that. If people would do what Jesus says here, that would never happen. You'd get to the bottom of it pretty fast. Sometimes the, the person who hurts you may be somebody who's kind of above you. Either maybe they're really wealthy or they're really popular in town or maybe they're really popular at church. And it could, maybe it could be me. I'm not uh, wealthy or popular, but, I've, but I have some, some, some uh, uh, you know, standing here. Maybe you know, the, he's the one who sinned against me, but I don't think I could go say something to him because he might, he might you know, hold it against me. And I get that. And so I think you're allowed on this stuff, even though it does say just between the two of you, if you're scared to have the conversation, you know, the very next verse here, he's going to say, if they don't listen, take a friend with you. Take, some, take a witness with you is what he actually says. Somebody who knows about the problem. And you can do that too. 
You know, take one other person there. And, and, but again, the goal is winning them over. The goal is smoothing it out. We give up on relationships so easy. Somebody hurts me and I say, well, that's it. We can't be friends anymore. Somebody hurts me and I say, well, that's it then. And I've known lots of people through the years who used to go to church or they used to be Christian. And the reason why they quit wasn't because they decided they didn't believe in Jesus anymore. Almost always the reason why they quit is because somebody hurt them and they never were able to reconcile. That's heartbreaking. It's the very first thing I, I said to you. Uh, uh, it should, it's a shock to us when we get hurt in church, but it shouldn't be. We're a collection of sinners. And Jesus didn't come to make all the bad people into good people. He came to give the dead people life. And for us who are just sinners, that's, that's really good news. I'm so grateful for His grace to me. And I pray that I can show grace to the other sinners who might bounce into me sometimes. I pray that I can show grace to the other broken people who may be struggling with their own sin, or they might be a hypocrite. And I hope that I can pursue them the way Jesus pursued me, win them over, so that we can put that hurt behind us and move to some better place. That's my prayer for you. That's always my prayer for you. And I'll be praying for you after we close this video up here today for that very thing.